let's get started here. So happy Wednesday, everyone. So today you are gonna be talking about actually uh, installation and deployment of Outlook server. It can be an upgrade as well, as you might think. So we already talked about, of course, introduction to server, expand the service scaling, as well as installation deployment. Here, as I noted now, we don't have the two last webinars, but of course we'll have the user side, the administrative side, as well as the gallery APIs and the production process for you to understand how to do everything related to uh, from publishing your workflow to running your analytical web inside your gallery, right? So let's get started here with our server installation and deployment. And for today, actually, we are going to be covering everything related to the installation process. For those that installed already, we are going to be covering uh, every configuration for you, all, all the best practices as well as since a lot of things are default options inside your uh, system settings, we're gonna be covering everything that you can do for performance improvement or for you to start checking your logins. So there are a lot of things that we're gonna be covering here. So everything related to your environment, your controller, worker, gallery, and engine, as well as some additional stuff here related to the service, to the, your uh, accounts, how do you manage that service? How do you manage your MongoDB backups and restoration, as well as how to troubleshoot everything that you have there. So we have login, we have the usage report, as well as some additional tips for you to get started, for you to not have any kind of problem after the installation. Since we are working with Autrix for a long time here, a lot of, uh, users, consultants, a lot of server that we already implemented. So there are some tips that we usually see users or admins uh, forgetting to, to do so. We will have a QA at the end, but you know already Thales is here answering all of her questions. He is a well knowledge ace. He's working with Outrix for a long time with a lot of complex environments. So the challenge is still here. If you have any questions, I challenge you to ask something that Thales doesn't know. I don't have a prize yet, but let's give it a shot, right? So starting with the installation overview, actually the first thing, of course, that needs to be done is for you to download the Outlook server installer right in order for you to do that we have a download portal we have also a licensing portal that goes basically to the same place you have this page actually for you to access this page of course you need to have a valid outreach site login if you don't have that yet you, you can create one after logging in here right and for you to have the, the whole access here, you need to have a valid license associated to that login. But it doesn't mean that you are gonna be using that license here, all right? But your account need to have the permissions for you to see everything that is here, right? You, you can be, for example, as myself, I'm an Outrix designer uh, licensed user author designer user, sorry. But I can see the whole thing here because my license administrator gave me the permissions to do so. So, right, so after clicking here on the Outrix server, you have the new version. So we are currently at the 21.3, all right? But as of now, since it's a best practice for us to always use one version, Previous to that, one or two versions, because of course, Outrix is releasing a lot of batches there. So if we have four major releases per year for the, uh, it's the 21.1 until 21.4, but we have minor releases as well. A bug correction or additional functionality that isn't working, for example. So that's why we always keep 
one step before. So all the presentations actually will be always related to the 21.2 version here. And as you can see, we have the installer for Outrix server, as well as one thing called here, Outrix server usage report. We're gonna be talking about this specific part later. I've showed you on our previous session how that actually looked like for you to start analyzing uh, everything that you have in your gallery, everything that you have in your server, the number of workflows, studios, collections, statistics related to all of those things. So that's always great for you to download that as well, right? So for the server installation, actually, it's very self-explanatory. It's ease of use. It's like on next, next, next. It takes like 30 minutes to finish everything. The only things that you need to be aware here is that for you to install everything, you must run as a, you must be or must run the installer as a local administrator or higher. One suggestion that we have is that always save the server to a separate drive from your lo local operator system. Of course, that if to avoid latency as well, you can use an SSD and not a network drive, never a network drive actually. And you can assign all the works or faces in directories to that same drive as the installation. That's something that we're gonna be covering later here in this session, but let's keep that as a default to save everything separate from your local operator system drive. You have one option as well for to install the predict analytics package right after finishing installing the Altrix server. But one thing that you always need to be aware there is that for if, of course, if you are an R or Python user and you are using a lot of different libraries there, you must install all of those libraries in Outrix server as well, okay? One other thing here that's always, that's actually uh, also related to Outrix designer as well, but since it's more common for you to uh, not have access, wireless access, Wi-Fi access, network access actually, from inside within your server, Outrix server, then you can also activate your license offline. So you have the licensing portal for that, and you will be able, of course, the Outrix support, the Outrix fulfillment team will be able to help you with that, but you can do that with your Outrix admin, your license administrator, okay? And one, another thing here that's always uh, a lot of users uh, keep asking on the community. So once you install the Outrix server, you'll be prompt to include your Outrix server license. But what happens if you cancel? So for you to license that, you can uh, open your Outrix designer from within your Outrix server machine and license the same way you would license your Outrix designer. All right? So that's one thing that you always need to keep aware, be aware. All right. So after finishing your installation, so you have two options here. The first one that I mentioned to install the predict tools, it's not mandatory. You can also download later the predict tools. The same one that you are using for Outrix Designer are the one used for Outrix Server. So you can get that from the download portal. But if you have, for example, for, for some cases where you are trying to upgrade your server from one old version to another, maybe the Mongo database version was upgraded from one version to another. And in that case, this will show up here. So it's an automatic way of migrating that Mongo database. Of course, you can do that manually. When you install Outrix server, it installed everything related to that migration, but it's always best for you to select this. Instead of 
in style and predict tools. Let's check this box and let's migrate the MongoDB. Of course, before doing that, it's always great for you to create a backup. That's something that we're going to talk uh, in a few moments. But this will update your version, your MongoDB version. So that's one thing that you always need to be aware when moving from one version to another. Of course, we have the a whole list there with everything related to all the versions of, and also for all the supported versions by Autrix as well. But that's one thing that's worth mentioning here. All right. So after installing everything, after migrating your work with your MongoDB, if you are upgrading, you can open your system settings. It's going to be an icon on your desktop. And you'll see something like this. Of course, as you can see here, it's all enabled already. So I have configured before my Autrix server. But for those of you installing for the first time, it will be everything disabled here. OK, so there's only a quick status of what is actually running inside your this specific machine. So if you have a multi-node environment, for example, then you start seeing, for example, that's only the controller and gallery enabled here and your worker has been scaled out for, for example. All right, so after that, you can always, always keep practicing next here. And let's go to our environment configuration. So at first here, you have actually four options. So of course, you install the Autrix server, you have a server license, but if you are crazy enough, you can use your server license as a designer only, right? But you can use as well as a designer plus scheduler. So if you don't want to have the gallery, gallery functionality, if you don't want to start sharing or collaborating, and it's only a matter for you to start scheduling everything that you have built. So you might think about using designer and scheduler only. But of course, here, if you purchase the Autrix server license, I think basically the idea is for it to have access to the complete environment. But of course, if you are scaling out your server, you can think about the customization. So if you want to include an, an additional worker node or an additional gallery node, it's the same installer. The only thing that you need to do here is to enable the custom installation or custom configuration of a specific node here. You can have that working as a controller plus gallery, a controller plus worker. So it's actually your choice. And you can have one controller each in a different machine, in a different server machine, all right? So the first configuration that we have, so it's a global configuration for all the logs, all the information, all the temp files, database files, everything related to what we are going to be configuring from this part on. So we can set that. And I suggest you include everything in the same directory as you install your Outrix server, of course. If you have installed that in a different place, different drive than your operational system. So let's keep everything outside of that and everything at the same place as well. So once again here, all the logs, all the database and all the temporary files, it's gonna be using this specific workspace and it's always great for you to set in a place where you can save large files, okay? So if you are running a heavier data set, for example, and the, the workflow will start creating temporary files in order to run that workflow, then if you don't have enough space here, the workflow will take, will take a lot of time or 
it won't complete actually. So it's always better as well for you to use an SST here for to improve the performance of your workflows, all right? Related to the controller. So as you remember, the controller is the brain of everything. It's actually, of course, the name of says the components that is controlling your whole server. The whole idea there, so we have a few components here. So the first one is a controller token. We have talked about that already. The whole idea here is that you can use this controller token for other workers. So if you're scaling out your server, other workers can connect to this specific controller to get jobs, to run jobs. But also for the Autrix designer users, if they want to connect to this controller to use the controller as a scheduler, because you have the scheduler components here, then Autrix designers users can run those workflows locally, for example. And one thing that's always worth mentioning, only regenerate this if you really need to, if you have some, some error connecting to this specific controller token. Because if you regenerate, all of the Outrix designers, all of the workers will lose connection to the controller. So that's one thing that you always need to be aware. You have the workspace here. So the workspace is related to the temporary or cache files. And once again, I will repeat this every time we get to a workspace, it's safe to always have a place there where you can save or write a large amount of files. And it's even better if you are using SSD. You have the login here as well. So for the login, uh, it's actually the default is high, but Outrix suggests you uh, the ideal for a production environment uh, where little logins needed. So let's keep this low. And if you are having issues related to your workflows, related to your controller, or anything related to your Outrix server, then you can set that to high and analyze and try recreating the problem that you are having. And that's also the level that Outrix support asks you before sending the logs for them to analyze, right? You have here the option for the scheduler. The default option is checked. So it's always better for you to leave this checked, but if not, maybe you may start experiencing connection, connection issues related to the scheduler connected to the worker or connected to your other designer. So it's always better for you to leave this checked. And we have two options here. So uh, for you to enable insights, we are gonna talk about that later, but it's always great for you to leave that enable as well. So insights are those interactive charts that we already, I already mentioned you in our previous session, but today I'm gonna be showing how that exact look like, right? And you have an option here for you to enable the AMP engine as well. For this one, it's always better for you to test that in your test environment. So that's why you have here the recommendation for specific environments only. So if you have, for example, own workflows uh, that's running data preparation, data preparation workflows, it can be heavier or small data sets. So that's one case where you can allow or enable the MP engine. But if I start running a lot of spatial analytics or predict analytics, maybe you need to test this first. So if you remember, we have a, a high improvement, high percentage of improvement when working with data preparation, but when working with patient and predicted, not as much as data prep. And that's something that we're gonna talk about later as well. For the persistence. So as you know, the controller acts as the orchestrator of all of the workflow executions 
and various other operations. And the controller needs a location where it can maintain everything related to workflows, the queue of execution requests, and any other information that it might have there. So we have three options here. So the option for the SQLite, as you can see, it's disabled. So it's disabled because if you have the gallery running here as well, if you remember the set, setup type, we leave that to, to the whole, the complete Outlook server, and the complete Outlook server has the gallery component enabled. So in that case, you can't use the SQLite. But for all the other cases, so we are usually using MongoDB and user manage MongoDB. And as you know already, user MongoDB, we have the benefits of start sharding, replica sets, all right? And one thing that's always worth mentioning when talking about the persistence is that we recommend you to employ a, a regular backup of your MongoDB and your MongoDB is in this data folder. Of course, that's something that we are gonna talk about later today, but it's always great for you to uh, keep everything backed up. We have as well here, the advanced database connection that's used for replica sets, sharding, or if you're using a cloud-based MongoDB. And here is the information that is created. Of course, if you're using the embed one, so it, the admin password and the password has automatically created here. But if you're using the user managed one, then you use the password for that one as well. Here for the persistence option, we have everything related to uh, the rules for you to start deleting your files, start deleting your queue information or the uploaded files. So it's always recommended for you uh, to not leave this unchecked or as zero. So zero means that you won't be deleting anything there. But of course, if you have a small Outlook server deployment, so you can leave that as it is, as and if your MongoDB start growing in a way that it's not advisable anymore, then you can set that to a specific amount of days here. And as you can see here, we leave this unchecked because this doesn't consume a lot of uh, a lot of hard disk, right? But for this one, since we have a lot of information here, a lot of gigs actually for upload, upload files and also results, that's where we need to actually be concerned. Yeah. So for mapping, so I have talked about this uh, on our previous sessions as well. The whole idea for mapping is that you are configuring this specific controller to act as a map controller as well. So the whole idea here is that uh, if you are using map input tool or map questions inside of an analytical web, for example, then you have here ways for you to, for example, for you to allocate the number of tiles that you want your memory to cache the amount of disk, the hard drive space that you have there allocated for to start using or rendering the styles, as well as the amount of time here that you will keep that available. So if you're asking yourself how much this is, so this actually, if I remember correctly, this is a day, I think so. I'm not sure, but I think so. I think it's a day. So what is actually happening here? So it's a very really specific configuration, but that's actually used, for example, here you have an analytical app and then you need your user to actually select a place here. And you have a lot of tiles here. So that's what this is actually doing. So if you start zooming in or zooming out, you are building tiles and that's 
what this configuration is all about. So if you have a lot of this, maybe you need to start thinking about uh, increasing your performance by increasing the, um, the number of tiles, the amount of megabytes here, as well as the reference layer here for it to leave cached or to leave that saved, okay? So for the worker configuration, so here is, is where your workflow is actually running. So have the workspace, your workspace here. And once again, a place to store large amount of files, always better if you have an SSD. You have here as well, the workflows allowed to run simultaneously as well as for you to allow the machine to run scheduled workflows. So if this specific worker is allowed to run scheduled workflows, then you need to leave that as it is. It's a default configuration. And for the workflow, allow to run simultaneously. If you have a four core environment, so for two cores, you have the best practice is for you to have one engine. So four cores, two engines, that's, if you are using the E1 engine, but if you are using the AMP engine, it's better for you to run only one at a time. You have here the option for you to cancel jobs automatically, but as you can say here, it's a hundred minutes. Then one thing that you always need to be aware if you have heavy workflow there running for more than two hours and you have no idea why that's getting canceled, so here is your option, your configuration, the quality of service. So this is more related to a mood node environment, but the whole idea is that you have zero. Zero means that you are running all the workflows. For example, three are only for critical workflows. That's of course is defined by the user that is saving that workflow on the gallery, but they also need to have permission to assign the quality of service. And that's all related to administration part of the Autrex gallery. And you can also here, if I have a multi-node environment, you can start creating job tags for the users. And you also need a permission to do so. Users to assign to a specific worker node there. So if you remember the, my example for the data, data science team, so the idea here, if you have one specific worker for that data science team, you have more cars, or you want to leave that uh, separated from all of the other workflows that you have there. So that's the whole idea for you to start creating job tags. And when the user saves the workflow or you start running the workflow from the gallery, then you'll be able to select what he actually wants to do. You have here as well the run as permission. So by default, Outrix server is always using the service account. And if you configure the run as credential, that's basically used for you to have access to the relevant locations. So for example, share folders, or if you are using uh, data sources with Windows authentication. So if that is what you are using in the designer, the server must have access to everything there as well. So that's when you configure this part here. Of course, you can have your service account with all the permissions there that works as well. But as you can see here, we have a lot of ways for using credentials, different credentials. Of course, the higher, the more important. So if you have workflow credentials, it's always gonna write everything that's below. So this is the most important one, right? So that's one thing that you always need to be aware when using the run as configuration. Here, so we talked about the mapping, but you allow your controller to actually allow this type of processes. And now you need to allow the worker as well. And, and actually why you need to do uh, 
two times here because you can have the controller in a machine and the worker in a different machine. And you can separate one worker only to start to use the mapping configuration. And of course, if you have this specific configuration, if you are using map questions and now you know what that actually is, if you are using that a lot, if you have a lot of users using that capability, a lot of analytical apps, then it's time for you to maximize here the max number of render workers, okay? The same goes for the insights. So we have here the option for the number of insights to run simultaneously, the max cache size as well. So for each cache directory, that means that you are saving, you are caching one specific insight, insight. So this is caching 20 different ones and what actually insights is. So this is insight and this example of insight. And you can start leveraging this if you have Autrix server. Of course, it's not as interactive as data viz tools, but you can see that you can start, for example, filtering. You can start uh, selecting anything here. You have drill down options here. So as you can see, you have city, you can click on city and you can see anything below that. So you have zip codes here. So that's one example that you can also start leveraging. Of course, as you start using this, this will start consuming resources, but that's a, a great functionality that are not, not a lot of users are actually using inside of Autrix server, but that's a great thing for you to start thinking about, All right? So gallery configurations. So. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna say once again, so you know the drill already for the workspace. Now I think you memorize. So SSD, large files. That's basically it. And you have also here the login directory. As you can see, since we configure the workspace, the global workspace here, it's all configured already. So this is all default. You don't need to be actually worried. Of course, you can browse and select a different folder there, but this is all default. For the base address, so here is local host, but you can include here your server name, your server IP, of course, it's already done. You can enable SSL. We have a tutorial there showing how to include the certificate and start using the SSL, right? But also you have here the default run mode. That's something that you can do from the Outrix gallery also. But here, if you leave that as a default run mode, and that means that, for example, uh, so uh, you want to prevent malicious workflows from running, from being executed. So the idea for you to, for example, select the safest mode here is that tools such as the run commands tool is not allowed to run in a safe environment. So that's the whole idea. Of course, you as an admin, you will be able to see that or to configure that from within the Outrix gallery manually for each workflow that is there. But here is for to leave that as a default, right? So it's the, the number of tools that you don't want the users to use, but also the place that you want the, don't want the users to get data from. So that's the whole idea when you think about this configuration. For the authentication as well, we have four options there. The built-in, so all the users need to create one specific account, but you have as well Windows authentication, Windows authentication with Kerberos and the SAML authentication. Here, it's all related to the SAML. So the options here for you to uh, obtain the metadata some other specific configuration for the EDP. Of course, for each of these options, we have a bunch of tutorials in Autrix community. I'm not gonna be covering because this is really specific, but the whole idea here is that you can use this for options as well here for your setting up your gallery administrator. 
So it's the, your first gather administrator, the first one. Of course, that you can have a multiple administrators there, but this will be the user that will be accessing the gallery for the first time and starting configuring everything that we're going to be talking about during the admin session and also the user session. So this is the first user connecting there. Of course, that you can change it as well. So if that user left the company or if it's not working, you can open the system settings once again, and you can change that to another gallery administrator. And one thing that you always need to be aware is that you can't change the authentication type. So after you execute everything and you create, create your MongoDB database, so you won't be able to change this. Of course, you will be able, you will be allowed, but if you do change it to another type of authentication, then you will start seeing some problems, some errors there. So sometimes one that I got already is that for a user, if you publish a workflow to the server, the user will not see the workflow there. So that's a huge error that you have there, all right? So that's one thing to always keep in mind. Please define your authentication method before and start configuring your Outreach server. Because if not, you'll need to rebuild once again everything. Of course, you can download the workflows automatically. That's something that we are going to be covering in another session. But it's always better for you to select the proper one at the first time. We have an SMTP configuration as well here. The idea here is for all the email notifications for various events, actually. So if you are using the built-in authentication method, you are if you register, you receive an email for you to set your password or reset your password, as well as if you are sharing a workflow with someone else, or if you are including the workflow to a collection, that's what this is actually being used. For the gallery persistence, you have this and it's set to a default. So for the web persistence, it's everything related to users and collections. And for the search persistence, of course, ways for you to start searching things on the gallery. And you only need to uncheck this if you are using replica sets, sharding, and so on and so forth. But that's the idea, the best suggestion here, leave as it is for now. Of course, if you're using a user managed one, maybe need to start thinking about this part as well. But this is the default configuration. For the engine. So for the engine here, it's basically the same information that you might encounter in your Outreach Designer system settings. So you have here the temporary directory. So if you are running your workflow and you have uh, a large data set that you don't have enough memory, that's where all the data is being saved. Of course, it will be deleted automatically, but the idea is that you need to have this temporary directory with the same configuration that I mentioned before. For the log ones, it's the same one that you are using our outer designer as well. That's something that we're going to be talking later today. And also for the package staging directory. So the idea here is that uh, when you are using, you are configuring, for example, uh, a workflow uh, opening in your designer, or if you are opening and configuring that workflow uh, on the gallery. So everything there is being staged in this specific place. So of course, when you publish your workflow to the gallery, it's actually packing that workflow, transforming to a zip with all your macros, all of your workflows, inputs, outputs, everything that you have there, and it's all being staged in this specific directory. You have the browse everywhere settings as well. So this is only for Outreach Designer, but this is disabled when you are using the Outreach server. So you don't need to configure that. You don't need to be worried about that when thinking about the server configuration. 
for the engine, you have two options here, actually three options, the original engine, the AMP engine, and both engines to be run. And if you select the both, both engine option, so it's for the user to select each engine they actually want to use. So that's one thing that you always need to be aware. Of course, when thinking about this specific and also related to the memory limits, that's one thing that you always need to be aware of, is that you are using worker and controller server, the complete server, for example, then you can have your memory limits defined like this. So total physical RAM divided by two, divided by the simultaneous workflow. So if the best practice is two, so it's total physical RAM divided by four. And if you have a standalone worker, that's better. So have the total physical RAM minus four, then divided by the number of simultaneous workflow. So that you can improve your workflow performance, okay? Also for the default number of processing threads, the best practice there is for you to use the number of logical processor plus one, okay? And you have here actually uh, options for you to allow users to override the settings that that's fine as well, but you can leave this unchecked. If you don't want the users to mess up with these configurations, and one another thing that's worth mentioning related to this configuration is this option to run engine at a lower priority. So the whole idea here is that, uh, for example, if you're running a high intensive workflow, memory intensive, CPU intensive, the whole idea there is that if you select this and leave this to a lower priority, so if you have other issues, in your Outlook server or other issue related to your operational system, that will be the priority. And the workflow running will be the last one. So it's always better for you to not uh, break your server then to leave your workflows actually running a little bit slower than it should, okay? Lastly, about the configuration, you have the prox configuration. So if you have a prox configure inside your Outlook server, you can auto detect that and use that to control everything that is happening. After all of that, you have the finalized screen. The only thing that you need to be aware of when you finalize your configuration is that it is restarting your Outlook service. One other thing that is doing, so it's, if it's it, the first time that you are uh, configuring the system settings, it's creating your MongoDB persistence layer as well, all right? But that's basically it. So moving forward to the Outlook system components. So the first one that we have there, so luckily we only have one service, the Outlook service, all right? And one thing, it's the default configuration. It's logging on as a local system account. So if you want to provide a credential here, a service account, and remember, if you are using this as your main credential, you always need to be aware that you need to have access to the share folders, data sources, and everything related to that. It's always great for you to have a recovery strategy here for failures. So the best practice here for, for the first failure, if you're having a problem, if you're Outlook service, let's restart our two times. And then after that, we can, for example, here, run a, a batch, a batch program, a batch file here to start calling people out, send an email for people to start checking what is actually happening to your Outlook service. Right, so really simple here. And also we have a lot of processes here. So we have, if you go to your task, task, task manager and you go to your details tab, you start seeing a lot of processes here. We have some of them that is related to designer. So if you have users here, we have a lot of users here using designer inside of our server. And you can see that we have a few processes there. So the whole idea here is that 
if you want the outer, if you want to whitelist or site troubleshooting or performance monitoring. So that's the one that you are going to be using for monitor designer. But you have also a few of those. I'm gonna not going to be talking about those. It's very specific, but it's here is the whole list of processes that you might encounter here. So in notes, not, not all processes will be present, present there. So it's all depending on your server configuration or what is actually running there, all right? What about backing up your MongoDB? So it's a very simple process. The only thing that you need to be aware is that you need to run as an administrator for backing up and restoring your MongoDB. So it's only three lines, command lines there. So the first one is to stop, save everything, the a Mongo dump process, and then let's start our server once again. So of course we have more complex uh, backing up. You can see you have a whole, a whole tutorial talking about everything that you can uh, also back up. You have examples showing how for you to start backing up your workflows as well only for it to be safe. Of course, uh, everything, all of your workflows are inside your MongoDB, but only if you want to keep, keep things safe there, for it to start always saving your workflows or always saving your configuration, your system status configuration, that's something that you can do as well. And that's the same for restoring your MongoDB. So you have the Mongo dump, and the Mongo restore here, the only thing that you need to be aware is that you need to stop your service as well as start your service later. For that, of course, since we have Outrix, let's run those, those batches there. We can use, you can use an Outrix workflow schedule in your gallery to do everything related to that, even copying pasting and moving workflows from one place to another, that's something that you can do with Outrix. If you didn't know, we have a exceptional macros that does that. Of course, you can use back scripts through your task manager, task scheduler, for example, or anything related to a third party, right? So what we recommend here for a production environment, for you to do that daily, it doesn't take a lot of time. Of course, uh, as your, your MongoDB increases, it's always best for you to uh, increase uh, or to limit the number of days that your MongoDB will keep the files, but this is a fairly simple process. And if you have the staging development, the staging or development, let's do that on a weekly basis, all right? So for actually for logging, so we have three logins here, three important ones. We have the engine, the service, and the gallery logins. The engine, it's all related to your Outrix designer. The same thing as you uh, were seeing your results tab, that's what you are seeing here. For the service logs, everything related to, to the brain of your operation. So the service layer, database, worker, and also controller, everything's here. And anything related to request, UI requests, you are seeing here on your gallery logs. So for the engine logs, really simple. You have the same one as your result. Everything you can see here, the number of tools. One additional thing that you have here is the job ID and also the workflow ID from the gallery. For the service logs, you can see it's quite a nightmare for you to look inside of these logs. So the suggestion here is always for you to keep looking for, so if you have any kind of error, you can look for the federal ones. So you have here the log level. So look for the federal and error ones and always focus on the message. So if you, if you want to start debugging or troubleshooting your server, that's your first step, your way to go. Of course, it's really specific. Maybe you don't know what it, actually that message uh, is all about, but your, it, this is your starting point. And that's the same thing for the gallery logs. 
So it's basically the same here. The only thing that you need to be aware as well is for critical processes, critical log levels, but always focus on the message portion. It's only a basic idea how for you to start dealing with your logs. But of course, one thing uh, that you can start using. So we have here one thing called how to obtain logs the easy way. So if you look that on your Autrix community, or go to your uh, browser there and write that down, Autrix and how to obtain logs the easy way. So you see this is specific app for you to start downloading. The whole idea here is that this will be used by the Autrix support team. So for all of things related to those logs, for problems, for troubleshooting your server, the Outrix support is there to help you. So any problem whatsoever, you can use this, you can finish, and then you will send this, this specific zip file that was created here for the support team. Almost at the end here, usage report. That's something that I showed you on our previous session. It's all related for you to start understanding everything that you have inside your gallery, inside your server. And that's the file that you would be able to also download with your Outrix server installer. So for you to configure that, that's really simple as well. So it's a workflow, the Outrix server usage report as everything related to Outrix, since we can do anything with Outrix, it's always workflows behind the scenes. And the only thing that you need to be aware when configuring this specific usage report is that it's all default here for it to run from within your Outrix server. And the only thing that you need to provide is the password. The password is the same one as you are using the persistence. The only thing that you need to be aware is that you need to be using the password and not the admin one, all right? And for that, if you use that, you will be able to use that report. We have a PDF report, but also a Tableau report, but you can create anything. So if you open actually this macro, you'll see what is actually happening. We are using a MongoDB connector that you also uh, have uh, are available for all of you. And then you can start building anything related to your MongoDB persistence layer. Last but not least, I think the most important part here are some tips. So for example, for when you are installing everything on your server, one thing that you always need to be aware are about your drivers, your driver versions. So if, if a user is using a specific uh, driver to connect to the SQL server, the Outrix server needs to have the same one, actually must have the same one. Also, the data source name, the DSN, must be identical for servers and designers to work. So when you, a designer user publishes a workflow to the server, you need to have the same name, you need to have the same driver. Of course, if you don't have, you'll see the error related to that, but that's one thing that's always worth mentioning here. So for Outrix macros, for Outrix macros uh, repository, you need to map everything to the same share folder. Of course, uh, when you are publishing workflows, you are able to send the macro package, but the whole idea here is that if you don't want to use that, if you don't want to pack your macro with your workflow, then you need to have a default repository for server and all the users as well. If you are not using workflow credentials or studio credentials, the service account must have access to everything whatsoever there. Share folders, data sources, and one last thing, one that I mentioned before, related to Python and R libraries, you need to install everything on your Outrix server as well. All right, I think that's it for today. Almost one minute left there. Let me see if I can answer any questions. So the only one that the Prussian is asking is if you'll be covering audit events collection in MongoDB. Actually, we won't. 
I think for the next year, since we have only seven sessions, one of the sessions of what we're thinking about including here was dealing with everything related to MongoDB. But sadly, the only thing that we are talking about MongoDB is that we talk now, right? Uh, one other question here is related to uh, the slides. So actually, uh, we will be publishing this in our YouTube channel. You will be able to see everything from there, but we won't be sharing uh, the slides material, all right? But that's basically it. Thanks a lot for joining today. Once again, I hope that you enjoyed as much as I have enjoyed and have a nice day and nice weekend as well. See ya. If you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, please comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to know when future videos are posted.